morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Steve Lunscum with the USA Rice Federation. I'd like to welcome you to the Texas Rice Research and Outlook Report. Uh, these reports are very different this year out of necessity. Normally, uh, they're made at the Rice Outlook Conference, which is held each year uh, about this time in early December in, in uh, one of the rice producing states. Uh, we have two excellent speakers this morning. Dr. Ted Wilson uh, will give the research report and Dr. Joe Outlaw will give the outlook report. And we are very honored to have Riviana Foods sponsoring our uh, reports today from the state of Texas. Uh, again, Dr. Ted, Ted Wilson, who is a center director of Texas A&M AgriLife Center at Beaumont. He's also a, a very distinguished research scientist, research entomologist, uh, and above and beyond that, he has done quite a bit of research in a number of different areas. I would like to make everyone aware that anytime you would have a question, there is a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So just type that question in and we'll get it to the, uh, to the presenters. With that, Ted, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be uh, putting on a quick time uh, player show summarizing major research activities uh, at the Beaumont Center. Uh, it'll take me a, a minute to get this thing going, but I really appreciate uh, having this opportunity. We are in a different time, but uh, there's so much good science, so much good research and extension activities. So I hope that we that we provide information that will be useful for those who are able to attend. Okay, uh, this video will start now, and uh, I'll be available to answer questions afterwards. My name is Ted Wilson. I am the Beaumont Eagle Lake Center Director. This includes video presentations on different aspects of rice production and management and addresses major issues that producers face when growing, managing, harvesting, storing, and marketing their crop. A special thanks to the Texas Rice Producers Board and the Texas Rice Research Foundation for funding much of the research presented in this first video. All of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension agents who organize this virtual field day and to each of the speakers who prepared videos. A special thanks to Pat Carey for flying the UAV drone in the first video to highlight major aspects of rice research at the Beaumont Eagle Lake Center. And a special thanks to Omar Samante for the considerable effort developing the video you are currently watching. During the first video, you will see a number of presentations on aspects of plant breeding, plant physiology, and agronomic insect, weed, and disease management. It is sometimes easy to forget the economic impact that research has had on rice production in Texas, and for that matter, the entire United States. Four statistics summarize the impact the best. Since 1945, rice yields have increased from an average of 1,600 pounds per acre to normally over 8,200 pounds per acre, representing a 513% increase during that period of time. With a bit less than half of this increase due to increases in varietal development, i.e. better varieties, and a bit more than half due to improvements in rice production and management. Rice grain quality has increased in relative terms by about 30% since the 1960s. Water use per acre of rice production has increased by about 35% when combined with the major increases in rice yields, this translates to the water use efficiency of rice production increasing by about 360% since the 1960s. Or simply put, 3.6 times as much rice grain is produced per gallon of water used today compared to 1960. Research continues to play an important role in ensuring the economic security of rice producers and the food security of our nation. 
but it is only because of our rice producers that this research has been made possible. The first video summarizes eight presentations, and I'm going to summarize these very quickly, but please watch the videos for the details. The rice breeding presentation by Omar Samante, Darlene Sanchez, and Jasper Puerto address grain yield and quality improvements to the inbred rice breeding project, release of a high yielding, high quality rice cultivar, which is named Trinity, the status of the hybrid rice breeding project, improvements in rice blast disease resistance by combining desirable genes using DNA marker assisted selection, and maximizing grain yield and improving grain quality in hybrid using DNA markers for wide genetic compatibility, allowing good genes to be incorporated for temperature sensitivity, mel sterility, and grain quality. This is followed by a presentation by Fugan Do addressing recent advances in rice nutrient management, then a presentation by Lee Tarpley and Abdul Mohammed, which address the impact of micronutrients on rice yield performance. Then a presentation by Mo Wei addresses sugarcane aphids on sorghum, rice water weevil and stem borers on rice, and the status of three new insect pests that have made their way recently into the United States. Presentation by Shane Zhou and Shankar Gar, his graduate student, addresses rice kernel smut and fungal pathogens associated with seedling diseases, while presentation by Muthu Bagafathanian and Shane Zhou address current research on weed management. The last presentation by Yubin Yang covers the development of web-based applications to predict seasonal development of different rice varieties and the management of insects that can otherwise cause major economic loss to stored rice following harvest, and then talks about the use of genetic models and UAV technologies to improve our understanding of how rice yields are impacted by climatic and biotic stresses. Each presentation summarized in this presentation can be downloaded from the Beaumont website by going to beaumont.tamu.edu and then selecting eLibrary, the second most right menu item, then run that runs left to right across the top of the screen, then selecting virtual field day, and then choosing which presentations you wish to download or view. For the next several days, we will be working on moving these presentations to different websites, including YouTube, to increase their availability and speed of access. Please stay safe, and we hope you have a successful 2020 production season. Thank you very much. For the highlights of the inbred rice breeding program, Trinity will be released as a new rice variety. It is a high yielding, high quality rice line. Compared to Presidio, Trinity's grain yield is about 12% higher, while its chalky grain percentage is similar. In preparation for the varietal release of Trinity, 600 panicles that showed minimal grain size variation and high quality were selected and planted in a hedgerow nursery to produce breeder seed. Texas Elite lines are continuously being evaluated in yield trials. 80 entries are being evaluated in the preliminary yield trials, 60 are in the statewide preliminary yield trial, and 49 are both in the advanced statewide yield trial and the multi-state uniform rice regional nursery trial. As part of this year's expansion in the inbred rice breeding program, the number of crosses that it will generate was increased from 25 to 100. Its pedigree nursery was enlarged from 3,100 to 4,200 rows. And the number of entries in its statewide preliminary yield trial was increased from 40 to 60. Furthermore, Texas elite lines in the preliminary yield trial and the statewide preliminary yield trial will undergo DNA marker assisted selection for blast resistance. 
two elite lines with high grain yield and low chalk grain percentages. These are RU130-3181 and RU180-3140 are in the breeding pipeline and are strictly being evaluated. Okay, good morning. Welcome to Texas A&M AgriLife Research at Beaumont. These are some of the uh, five key points or highlights of our project. Its most advanced cytoplasmic male sterile lines are in the fourth backcross generation and will be crossed with restorer lines to generate hybrids for evaluation in next year's preliminary yield trial. Its potential thermosensitive genetic male sterile lines or TGMS lines are in the third filial generation and are undergoing DNA markers assisted selection for the TGMS gene. Those selected will be harvested for seed and grain quality evaluation this year. Its evaluation of high quality inbred lines which are in their fifth and sixth filial generations are undergoing marker assisted selection for the possession of wide compatibility and restoring factor genes. Both of these are needed in making new restorer lines for male parents to create high yielding hybrids when crossed with cytoplasmic male sterile lines. Those without the restoring factor genes have the potential for use as new maintainer lines. Also, grain quality is a major selection criterion and advanced inbred lines are being screened for low chalky grain percentages, long grain type, and intermediate amylose concentration using digital image and near-infrared grain analyzers. The heterotic group approach to breed for high grain yield is being verified in a yield trial study this year. Grain yields of hybrids produced by narrow process, for example parents that belong to the Japonica subspecies of rice, are being compared against those produced by wide process. These are parents belonging to different heterot groups, for example, a Japonica crossed with an Indica rice. The group of hybrids produced from wide process showed higher grain yield and tiller density in last year's yield trial. The objectives of the hybrid rice breeding program are to develop hybrid varieties and parental lines with high and stable grain yield and improved grain quality. The Marker Assisted Selection Laboratory of the Hybrid Rice Breeding Program started to become fully functional in 2020, which will help increase efficiency in achieving its breeding objectives. Identification and use of wide compatible parental lines will produce intersubspecific or Indica by Japonica hybrids with normal seed set and increased levels of hybrid vigor. The use of thermosensitive genic male sterility or TGMS system will potentially increase the options for heterotic combinations in hybrid rice. In order to improve the competitiveness of U.S. rice in the international market, we are using marker-assisted selection to screen for grain quality genes in legacy rice varieties from countries where the U.S. exports and imports rice. Here in our hybrid rice breeding group, we are working on improvement of blast resistance by pyramiding genes using DNA marker assisted selection. Use of resistant cultivars offer a long term control for blast disease, but the fungi causing blast has multiple strains and it evolves more rapidly than the cultivar. Thus, there is need for releasing cultivars with more durable and broader range of resistance to different blast strains. The objective of this study is to develop a blast resistance screening pipeline for our breeding program using marker assisted selection. We aim to determine the presence of multiple known blast resistance genes, aka PI genes, pyramided within developed test lines that will be evaluated for efficacy of resistance to blast disease. 
this marker assisted selection screening pipeline is being applied to improve our breeding efficiency by selecting rice lines that exhibit positive blast resistance DNA markers and eliminating those without it. This screening will allow us to focus on improving the test lines with multiple positive blast resistance markers. In 2020, we have two major field trials conducted at both Boma Research Center and Eagle Lake Station. The first one is our bridal assessment. We pretty much focus on newly released and popular varieties being tested to look at their performance at both Boma Center and Eagle Lake Station. The second one is our nitrogen measurement, specifically our nitrogen applied before permanent flooding and sub-optimal soil conditions like wet soil or soil is flooded and determine what is the best nitrogen measurement strategy as well as to evaluate nitrogen loss associated with ammonia volatilization. Thank you. Dr. Tarpley and Mohammed of the Plant Physiology Project have been working with Phelan Biosciences to test a potential plant growth regulator that's applied in early grain filling to promote grain filling and thus grain yield and quality. As part of the project, an unfarmed trial was coordinated with Randy Walagura. There is a rain interruption of harvest, but the producer estimated advantage of the higher PGR rate was 400 pounds per acre. In 2019, Dr. Tarpley Mohammed initiated a study with Sample Industries and LC Fertilizers to test a number of micronutrient fertilizer blends that are applied over the top. In this first year of the study, a copper, phosphorus, sulfur mix stood out as providing a yield increase over the adjuvant only control of about 900 pounds per acre. Howdy y'all, this is Mo Wei. I'm the entomologist. I've been here for 38 years. Uh, this is basically my last field season, but I did want to give you a few uh, bullet points on the research that we're doing this year. Uh, first of all, we're determining uh, yield losses due to stem borers in Presidio and a hybrid uh, in a planting date study. Second, uh, we're evaluating a novel insecticide called Prevathon. It has the same active ingredient as Dermacor X100, the seed treatment and we're looking for uh, rice water weevil control with this product as well as stem borer control. Uh, third, uh, we're, we are monitoring the Texas rice, bowl, uh, rice belt for the exotic uh, rice plant hopper, rice delf acid, which is native to South America and Central America. And we found uh, populations here attacking ratoon rice in Texas uh, in uh, the last several years, beginning in 2015. And uh, fourth, uh, with help from our crop consultants, uh, we are monitoring uh, the Texas rice belt for two exotic species of rice stink bugs. We have a native species. Uh, the scientific name is Evilus pugnax. And uh, there are two other species that are exotic uh, that were found in Florida, uh, attacking rice in Florida. So we're seeing if, if we may have those two species here in in uh, Texas. And uh, that's about it. And I just want to thank you for uh, your support over the years. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Rice Plant Pathology Project is conducting 21 field trials on variety resistance screening fungicide efficacy evaluation 
and beneficial endophile seed treatment at the Beaumont and Eagle Lake sites in 2020 to evaluate and develop resistant rice varieties and effective fungicide for control of rice diseases important in Texas. A success of rice disease control is dependent on three key management practices. Selecting a resistant or partial resistant variety, using effective fungicides and applying fungicide at the right time. Rice kernel smart continued its a severe occurrence in Texas in 2019. Amistad top is the most effective for control of kernel smart follow the proper cortisone containing fungicides such as the TILT based on the results of field trials conducted in Texas. Epistatop, the only fungicide that has been labeled for use in the Latone crop, is effective control of circles water when applied on the Latone crop. Update of three fungicides. New fungicide x carrier of valent for control of rice sprout is expected to receive the label for rice in 2020 and to be available in 2021. New fungicide Amistar Top of Syngenta, labeled in 2018, provides excellent control of kernel smart and good control of sheath blood, blast, and circus border. Stratego of Bear, which has been used to provide excellent control of rice blast and good control of other diseases, we discontinue the labor for rice. I'm Shankar Gaire and I'm going to discuss about fungal pathogen associated with rice silic disease. Silic blight that is caused by several seed burn and soil burn pathogen is one of the important silic disease in dry seeded rice. The disease symptom includes pre and post emergent damping up resulting thin or irregular plant distance. We did a survey in 2018 from 19 crop fields of Texas to identify fungal pathogens associated with this disease. What we found is that Rhizoctonia solani, AG11 and AG4, Fusarium species, and Scrosium rolfsi are the pathogen that fungal pathogen that causes seedling blight in Texas. Among these fungal pathogens, Rhizoctonia solani, AG11 is a dominant species and Rhizoctonia solani AG4 is a new fungal pathogen that causes seedling blight in rice. For the management of this disease, Texas farmers should target on that this pathogen using the fungicidal seed treatment. Thank you. This summer, we have field experiments with four industry cooperators at the Eagle Lake Rice Research Station. Cotiba. We have two experiments with Cotiva this year. In the first one, we are testing tank mix or premix combinations of loyant with clincher. In the second Cotiva sponsored experiment, we are testing loyant as part of a broader herbicide program where loyant is placed as a pre flood application. Adama. We are evaluating prefix, which is imazithapyr, and postscript, which is imazamox, herbicides for weed control in the rice stakes full page rice production system. UPL. In this experiment with UPL, we are testing different formulations of proponel for weed control and rice injury. Sipcam Avan. Here, we are evaluating a generic formulation of clomazone. The commercial name is Caraval and compare it with command. Rice Development Advisory is a web-based application that can predict rice growth stages and make stage-specific management recommendations. Post-harvest grain management is also a web-based application that can assess the control of grain moisture, grain temperature, and the rice pest in storage being using air aging control. Drone technology has the potential to provide a fast field testing and crop status monitoring. GM mod assist program has the potential to accelerate rice breeding for higher rice 
through performance evaluation and early elimination of poor performing genotypes. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. That was excellent. We really appreciate all of your faculty members' participation virtually in, in our uh, research presentation today. I want to personally just express my appreciation to Dr. Wei, who did say that, that you know, he announced he was retiring. Mo and I started uh, about the same time in 1982. Uh, he had Beaumont and, and myself at the LSU Ag Center and, and Mo has been really just a true treasure for the for the uh, U.S. rice and, and international rice industries and uh, like you said earlier you might fill the position but Mo will never be replaced and uh, that being said again I want to remind everyone that we do have uh, the question and answer icon down at the bottom of your screen. Again, I want to thank our sponsor, Riviana, for uh, sponsoring today's Texas presentations. Uh, and uh, Ted, did you want to finish up with anything before we jump to the outlook? I'd like to also thank Riviana and uh, the Rice Outlook Conference organizers for giving us an opportunity to keep this tradition going. It's, it's so important to interact uh, with the scientists, with our growers, and the Rice Outlook Conference is, is an important part of that. Yes, sir, and I agree completely. And thank you, uh, and thank your, your faculty members. Thanks, So our, our next presenter is Dr. Joe Outlaw, who I think everyone is very familiar with. Joe is a professor and extension economist the co-director of the Agriculture and Food Policy Center on the Texas A&M campus. And, and Jill, I, I wanna personally thank you. Every time we have a rewrite of the Farm Bill, Jill was very intimately involved with that, with the U.S. rice industry, and is instrumental in, in making sure that when we do have a new Farm Bill, it's, it's the best we can possibly get. So thanks. Sure, um, are we... Can you see my screen fine? We, we can, it's perfect, thank you. Okay, great. Well, I wanna start off also by thanking Riviana for the for the uh, sponsorship. Obviously, these meetings don't happen without people stepping up and, and we really appreciate that. So the report today on the Outlook, obviously uh, you kind of teed me up. I'm gonna talk a little bit about policy stuff and it's, you might say, how's that Outlook? Well, it's gonna feed into the next Farm Bill discussions uh, so I need to talk about that a little bit. So I'll be talking about some of our rice farms and our representative farms we do for Congress. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, just some cost factors that I see kind of impacting things as we go along. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't keep up with this stuff, we, we do work for Congress, uh, get significant funds to go around the country and develop a representative operations that would be able to run what if analysis for them. Uh, so we have done that with with the rice industry and we're very well represented in, in the rice industry with uh, 15 farms. And so those are people some of you I looked at this I looked at the attendee li list and there's a couple of you on here. Um, those are people real people that we meet with that we sat down and said, Okay, we're going to develop this paper on this farm on, on paper, but uh, uh, we want to do the best we can so that when we do what if analysis on different policy alternatives, we can, uh, we'll be as good as we possibly can. And so we've been doing that for quite some time. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things today. 
for the average person, for us university guys, uh, if you told me I only had a uh, 20, if I had a, as much of a 25% chance of, of not cash flowing and losing some of my wealth, I wouldn't think that's actually good. But when you're looking at agriculture indicators, you kind of have, that's, that's actually good. If there's only a tw quarter of a chance, uh, 25 to 50%, that means, you know, I would probably be devastated personally, but, but agriculture tends to operate in that range. And if you're in the red or the poor, greater than 50% chance of not cash flowing. And, and so we, we developed this, I developed this when I took over doing policy work, we had to have a quick and easy way of showing Congress and their staff kind of how things went on the fly. And so, you know, you can throw up a graph and here's all of our rice farms and I've highlighted the Texas ones. But if you look at it, the very middle column, positive pr probability of ne negative ending cash, only one of them was red. Uh, one was yellow and two were green. And that was our January baseline used in factory projections as of that time on, on national prices and inputs. On the far right side, very low probability that wealth declined. So basically a little cash flow problems that's not bleeding over into eating equity. And so that was a pretty good outlook in January. And that was right after the phase one deal with China was all trumpeted as we're gonna really move some stuff um, then COVID hit, but, but let's just say, let's just look quickly. The prices at that time uh, were higher than this. So I'm gonna do an update here. We updated in, in August. This was after COVID devastated a lot of things. Rice moved for a while, um, but the early prices in January are higher than what I'm showing you here. And so when I show you the next set of results with lower prices, and you know, inputs. This is over, this is the broad measure of all inputs for all types of crop agriculture. You know, you only see a few negatives on there for 2020. Uh, then you don't see any in the projections going out farther other than seed prices in 2021. So when you start looking at you know, as I tell people that in Washington all the time, you know, costs relatively rarely go down uh, and that's just the way it is and that's the way people have to work with. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but but you can't plan on it. Uh, so when I show you these results, I've updated as of August, uh, none of our cash, uh, Texas rice farms cash flow and you look around the country and there's a lot more, a lot more red and yellow than there was in the first slide I showed you. And when you have problems cash flowing, if you let these farms run out, and people either don't quit or figure out something else, um, then you bleed over and on the right-hand side, you get, you start drawing into equity. And so what does this mean? This means that with government payments that what we have uh, from the farm bill, uh, we would project out as of right now that, that at least the Texas farms and a lot of other states would be in some severe cash problems. And that's absolutely being seen around the country. Uh, not everybody, some, some folks are in a little bit different situations, but, but uh, you know, we still don't have the losses in equ equity. And one of the reasons why is this land values keep churning on upward, uh, even though the people are not cash flowing. So one of the things that I did last year, and there was a number of questions about it, um, we put together and I had the guys that, you know, we have a team of people and, the, and George Knopic here in our group is the program leader for that. Uh, he put together this for me and basically we updated recently and added uh, Tim Gertzen, although I hope he's not on here to see that he's a good addition to our group. But uh, uh, no, we appreciate everyone's help. And, and the only thing I'll say is we're about to be hitting on almost every one of you because the COVID has put us behind. So we're gonna be reaching out to people trying to get these things up to date for the next farm bill so that we have the best information going forward. But quickly, just looking at what they did uh, in that update, um, you know, it talks about groundwater and, and basically uh, it's a groundwater farm. Stop worrying about surface water um, on that particular farm. Irrigation cost was lower, $120 an acre. They actually decreased the farm size. It was 3,200 acres. Now it's gonna be 2,500 acres. Uh, that's, that doesn't happen very often. Most of the time when we work with these panels, there's people trying to figure out how to get larger and larger and then 
at least in the rice industry, that's probably not as much indicated there. Uh, they eliminated soybeans, all corn. Uh, budgeted yield, I'll, I'll just say, you know, the bright spot on this is when you have the big yields that these guys do west of Houston, uh, they can really make up for, make up, make some ground uh, with the return crop, getting the 110 hunter weights. Uh, on the, I tried to do my best on the east side to figure out what crawfish returns were going to be. Uh, shockingly, there's not a data set out there that I could turn to to, to look at outlook for that. But obviously, producers are very innovative and they're trying to do the, everything they can. And if, if, if in, in the situation where you have the opportunity to raise uh, uh, crawfish, they can also increase the returns and help out. Uh, I found it very interesting that the, the group decided to, to, to move the farm back to 50-50 mix on hybrid and conventional seed. They had been 100% conventional. Obviously, in the purple there, it shows that, well, it's a little bit more expensive, but uh, they made the decision that that was what they wanted to do. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, rice is everyone says, well, yeah, it's an irrigated crop and there's very little risk, so we're not going to buy high levels of insurance. And that's indicated here. The average, in, the average coverage in Texas is, is about 75% revenue coverage on everything across the board. Um, and, and certainly uh, rice would be, you know, 55% yield coverage is, is kind of an anomaly. We don't have very many other crops that would just do that level. Uh, one of the things I did want to look at was in the past, and this, this graph shows nitrogen, potash, phosphate, and fuel costs. It was kind of tracking the long grain uh, market year average price. It tracks it pretty well, actually, uh, uh, being that the, uh, uh, you can see what the fuel price is. Um, but there are other costs that over time haven't tracked so well, and they don't really move up. They just move up. And wages is a number one, supplies and repairs another, seed, chemicals, machinery, um, have tended to have a general increase in inflation and that's just the way it goes. So that kind of leads a little bit of credence to what I said earlier about when I talk to people in Washington, I say, you know, the costs rarely come down. They do sometimes, but it's a rare situation. When you look at the planted acres and trying to think of what we're gonna do in the future, uh, you know, you can look at Texas planted acres and in the 12, 13 time frame that was impacted by water availability. So those planted acres were really far down uh, relative to what we're doing now. Um, the interesting thing for me is, you know, as an economist, we're always trying to figure out, well, are producers making decisions on the number of acres based on expected prices? And there's a lot of ways you can get expected prices, but what the, the insurance prices are uh, is a monthly average, a certain contract, certain monthly average of that sets the projected price for insurance. So a lot of times we'll use that as, hey, that's the earliest signal that producers would get of where the prices might be. And so I have put in there in the middle of that, the projected prices for insurance for rice. And again, I have heard many, many times from my friends all over the United States about how thinly traded rice is and that the future isn't that great of an indicator. But you know what? Out of all these prices, the movement from one year to the next, only in 2014 did the price went down, acres went up. Every other time, if price, the expected price was higher, the acres went higher. If the, if the expected price went lower, the, the acres went lower. It's not perfect, but it actually follows what econ economists would say is supposed to happen. So where are we looking at right now? The prices are actually edging up. So when someone asked me, what do I think is gonna happen in 2021? Not knowing how much seed was sold, that'd tell me a lot if I had asked anybody those questions. But not knowing how much seed was has been purchased or booked, uh, I don't really know. But looking at those numbers and knowing where I think the futures market is trading right now, no, we're nowhere near the time period to set insurance prices. But where the market's trading right now, I would say we're going to have more than 184,000 acres. Uh, why, do I, why do I say that? Specifically looking at this chart. Now, there are a couple of things that I'd say, okay, 
this chart doesn't tell you everything. Obviously, water availability, like we saw uh, after 2011, basically uh, that could that could drive a lot of things. Relative crop prices are very very important in agriculture. A lot of times, uh, economists try to make sense out of numbers like these, and it's the relative crop prices for the the things that can be grown in the area stink. And so when they stink, you tend to get your safe crop for that area and for rice producers it tends to be rice. Why? Because you might have risk on the price side, but you have that you don't have as much risk on the on the can I make a crop side, which is very, very important. And so when when uh, prices start kind of falling off, you get uh, uh, you get people kind of huddling back to rice. Now with with the futures on corn going up, you'd say, well, Joe, why would you expect more than 184? And the answer is, uh, it, it's gonna be in that range, in my opinion, just because uh, corn has moved up, yes, but it's really just now getting to be the part that's actually in the break-even part for Texas producers. Uh, so if, if people wanna challenge me on that later, we can. And obviously whether you, know, whether you can get your crop in or not uh, on time is, is always an important thing. So. That's one of the things that I tend to think about. Um, we put together for the uh, guideline, rice guidelines, we take the information from representative farms and we kind of came up with a, what's a West of Houston farm? And this is not a representative farm. This is kind of your average farm that we use in extension budgets. And you're gonna notice the first thing, it has a is it has an 8,600 weight yield, not 110 that we're using with the high flying people that we work with on our panels. This is more of your average budget. Uh, that average budget on the first crop shows a negative $270 return. You see there's no government payments. The government payments should be somewhere around $145 for this farm. So you'd still be looking at a $70 loss on the first crop and a $7 gain on the second crop. So I'll have, I have people all the time ask me the question, why in the world do people plant whenever that doesn't look like they're gonna make any money? And the answer is it's all economics and if they can contribute to their, uh, cover all their fixed costs and contribute to variable, they're gonna, they're gonna or said that, I said that backwards, cover all the variable and contribute to fix. Um, they're gonna do it. I mean, it, it's just the way it is. You got all that, very equipment that is is good but it's very unique to rice and you want to utilize that equipment um so with that i'm going to end the outlook to me looks very strong you got prices uh, uh re rebounding and um uh frankly i i think that uh, we're in a, in a very good split, spot so uh, I'll be willing to take any questions if anybody had any on the uh, queue there, Steve. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Outlaw. Uh, do have a point of clarification. Excalia fungicide will not be launched in 2021 for rice. And uh, Ted, I do have a question for you. Uh, comment first was nice presentations for you and your team. The question is, how was the blast situation in 2020 in Texas? And what is tr the trend of the disease situation in comparison with the last few years? And I'll, I'll try to give an answer that's, that's good. Uh, as you know, blast comes and goes. Uh, and we don't really have good resistance to blast in our germplasm. And we screen hundreds and hundreds of genotypes and a uh, few have it, few don't, but most don't. Uh, this year wasn't, uh, as a whole, wasn't a particularly bad year. Uh, our, our bigger challenge that's, that's become more and more in the last 20 years are twofold. One, 20 years ago, narrow brown leaf spot or scientifically called sarcophagus, <coughs> was, was not considered to be a problem. Now we're seeing uh, some serious damage. We can still totally control narrow brown leaf spot on the retune crop, 
but on the main crop, it's, it's sometimes a challenge. The other challenge in the last several years has been um, uh, curl smut. And to the point where uh, we've seen serious problems where growers have had to mix uh, loads to get below the uh, USDA standard. And only thing I can say there is that watch your nitrogen. Uh, the the uh, curl smut is exacerbated tremendously when you put high levels of N on both the, uh, the main crop, but also to a degree, the ratoon crop. We're seeing some loss of innate resistance to diseases, some diseases in the hybrids. So historically, the inbreds have been more uh, susceptible to all the diseases but we're seeing a shift and it's probably what we call a, a biotype shift, which really just means uh, resistance is beginning to develop uh, by the disease, not chemical resistance, but by the disease to the defenses that are found uh, in the hybrids. So I, I've probably covered more than you want, but, but those are a bit of an update on the pathology side. So, uh, Joe, we got a question here. What do you feel the percentage increase in acreage for ice in 2021 looking into your crystal ball? For, for Texas or for the nation? Well, how about both? <laughs> yeah, okay. So I, I, I shouldn't have even said that because I'm not prepared to say the nation. But I, I think for Texas, you know, I, I, would, I will not be surprised if it's at least 5% higher than it was based on the numbers I've just looked at. I haven't talked to anybody about any kind of plans. I just, looking at the numbers, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, if it's not at least 5% higher. So another question, and I think it relates to, you know, the, the previous one is, what is the water situation for rice irrigation going into 2021? Are you in pretty good shape? For, for rice, we mostly are in pretty good shape. Although the, the challenges in the Austin area, which is the largest quote growing multiplex in the, in the nation, poses some long-term challenges, maybe even partly for 2021 in terms of available water. Um, if you head further east, uh, water situation is quite good. Another question, and I think it relates to some of the issues that are arising with, with some of the MRIs that we're seeing for chlorate in, in Europe and UK. Uh, do you have an idea how much of the Texas crop uh, where sodium chlorate is typically a, applied before harvest? And I know it varies. I'm afraid I don't, Steve. I can get those numbers or get estimates, but I, I don't have good numbers. So this is a question from me uh, to, to Joe. You mentioned crawfish, and I've really always been amazed that there's not more crawfish production, especially east of Houston, because, you know, we have a huge number of crawfish trucks coming from southwest Louisiana into, into Houston just about every day during the crawfish season. Do you have, you have an idea why there's not more crawfish production in that region? I really don't. You know, that I, I spent yesterday trying to dig up as mu anything I could, and, and there's just, it's not a, it's not something that's just government data on. So that I, I don't know. Uh, all I know is, is that the people that do it, and I could, I could say their names, they're not on here, but the people that I know that do it always do it, and they seem to do it um, because they make money at it. And you know, obviously the Galdings are who I'm talking about and they, uh, I'm pretty sure they were featured on a Farm Bureau uh, video that, that really talked about what, how, they, how their operation works. And, and uh, so I've always been, I've got the same question, Steve. I mean, um, there's probably something there that I don't know the answer to, but, but there's a lot more people that I know that did it, do it east of Houston than west of Houston. I don't know anybody west of Houston. So 
Um, it, I'm not sure, but believe me, um, I think it changes the economic picture for East of Houston, which tend to, tends not to have as high yields, at least in the work we've always done. Scott, Steve, if I could interject. Um, Joe's, Joe hit a family uh, on the head with the nail, so to speak, with the Galdings, uh, John and Alan, and their income, uh, net income, from crawfish uh, part of their operation exceeds that for the rice part, at least two years ago it did. Uh, so I don't have an answer either. Certainly, when we think of crayfish, we think of of uh, or crawdads, we think of Louisiana, but there's really no difference in the soil characteristics of a major nature uh, to the east of Houston and Texas. So I, I don't know the answer either, but it's an opportunity. So another question, I guess, uh, that I would like y'all to kind of touch on is, is there's probably more organic rice production in Texas, and I guess probably any other state. Is that growing or is that kind of staying the same? What What is your long-term, I guess, forecast on organic production? Steve, it's, it's fluctuated tremendously over the last roughly 10 years. And uh, back about uh, eight years ago, when uh, the price of rice was up to uh, say $14, around uh, 13 something, uh, or even less, organic made sense because they were getting at that time $28 per hundred weight. When the price shot up uh, some years ago to uh, temporarily $16, 20 some dollars, the organic uh, be, uh, went, dropped acreage uh, very fast because when it's stuck at $28 compared to say 16 or even 20, rarely, it just, it just didn't cost out, in, in, uh, wrong term, it just didn't uh, net out compared to conventional. So when conventional prices are low, as long as the organic prices aren't tied directly to them, they tend, we tend to see an upswing in acreage. Well, again, uh, thank you, Drs. Wilson and Outlaw for your participation here today. Both of your presentations were excellent. I do wanna thank all of our participants today. I wanna to again thank Riviana Foods for sponsoring the Texas Research and Extension Reports. And uh, I wanna make everyone remind everyone that our last state reports will be California or report will be California, which will be tomorrow, Friday uh, at, at 1.30 Pacific time. So that'll be 3.30 Central time. So with that, again, thank everyone for being with us today and uh, thank, thanking again, Riviana, for your sponsorship.